You are listening to Blessed and Bossed Up, presented by Anchored Media, an entrepreneurship podcast for Christians all about how to make God the CEO of your business. Get ready to be inspired, challenged, but well-equipped to live and build your destiny his way. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Blessed and Bossed Up podcast. Remember this week we're catching up on chapter six and seven of Battlefield of the Mind by Joyce Meyer. Last episode we went over chapter six. Today we are discussing chapter seven, which is called Think About What You're Thinking About. Now again, if you are not reading the book, that's totally fine. These episodes will still bless you. If you do want to join us in this book club, go ahead and click the link in the show notes to get your copy of Battlefield of the Mind by Joyce Meyer. Now, this chapter, the title is rich <laughs> by itself. Think about what you're thinking about. Now, remember, I told y'all I've read this book multiple times. It's been some years, though, since the last time I read it. The first time I read this book, I was in a space where I was new in my relationship with God. I was new in studying the word. I was new in this process of just allowing him to transform me. And so to be honest, once I got to this part and this whole concept of think about what you're thinking about, it was a bit overwhelming. Like I knew that I wanted to win the battlefield of my mind. I knew I wanted to and needed to take my thoughts captive. I knew I didn't want to deal with anxiety and stress and overwhelm and negative thinking and all of those things. I knew that I wanted to be victorious in this way. And up until this point, the book had been very encouraging. And even as we're reading it back, it's encouraging, it's enlightening, but it ain't too much. Once we got here (laughs) back then, it became a bit too much because I was in a space where I'm like, God, I am in total unfamiliar territory here. And to be quite frank, when I truly gave my life to God and got saved, saved as I call it, if it was a isolating experience for the most part, I had folks in my life where, and, and I thank God for this, he's always placed people in my life to pour into me and mentor me exactly where I need to be. So at this time, I did have uh, someone in my life who was, I was able to call and be like, okay, I read this scripture, but I'm not sure what this means. This person told me about the study Bible. And so I went to um, Barnes and Noble and got the life application study Bible that I recommend here all the time. I got that Bible based on that recommendation for the first time. I was able to call and say, Hey, I read this. I think it means that, but how do I apply it? And I was able to get poured into, get prayed for all of the things. So I did have someone, but it was an isolating experience because I was in this spot where I was totally transitioning into new territory. I was in my earlier 20s. I was newly um, an entrepreneur coming to the point where I was about to leave my job. I was already feeling isolated in that because a lot of my peers were still finding their career paths after college. They weren't, they were interested in like generational wealth or um, side hustles and things of that nature, but nobody was looking at building a business the way I was. I wanted to build a company full time that was widely successful and I was throwing myself totally into it. So I was feeling isolated in that. I was feeling isolated on a spiritual side because everybody I knew was still in them streets and I was still in them streets as well and trying to claw my way out. So I was just feeling very lonely in a lot of ways. So while I did have someone to pour into me, It was a lot of transition at the same time. At this time, I was also dating my husband and BJ and I are seven years apart. So he's seven years older than I am. So he was more established. He was mature. He was sure that he was ready to get married. He knew that he wanted to be married to me. It was just a matter of when I was ready. And so I'm dealing with that. Nobody in my friend group were in relationships and definitely not in relationships where marriage was something in the foreseeable future. So it was a lot of transition for me at this time. And reading this book, it was helping me with the mental overwhelm of it all. But this chapter in particular went from the book providing me with tools and relief to the book giving me something else to stress about. Because thinking about the thought of thinking about what I'm thinking about instantly gave me anxiety. But And I'm like, I'm going to go crazy. 
I'm already someone who it lives in my head. <laughs> so essentially, you're making me live there even more because now I have to be thinking about every single thought that comes in. Y'all, I was like, this is a lot. <laughs> this is a lot. And I feel like if I remember correctly, I might have put the book down at this point. <laughs> so, so this, if you are in that space, if you're reading this with me and you're in that space and you feel how I felt when I first got to chapter seven. I see you. I understand you. If you're planning on reading this book, take this as a forewarning that you might get to the point as well where you're like, this has now become a bit too much. However, now being a lot more mature in my faith, being a lot more wise, being a lot more mature um, in my relationship with God and my understanding of the word, being a lot more settled in living a righteous lifestyle, looking at this text now, I want to emphasize the importance of taking this chapter seriously because it's in that space of that normal reaction to this, that the way that this may stress you out uh, or make you anxious by taking on the task of thinking about what you're thinking about. Like I, I understand And I feel like that is a normal reaction to it. But I have to warn you and encourage you to push past that because this is one of the most important tactics that you can employ in your life. And this is one of those strategies that if you employ it, you will see victory that you cannot even possibly fathom. You will receive an experience in abundance That's greater than what you can ask for or think, just like the word says. You will experience a life where you are prosperous in everything that you do. And I'm not saying that as no prosperity gospel type stuff or trying to manipulate God into giving you anything. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that there is a fullness to this experience in this life with Christ. There is a a fulfillment. There is an abundance. There is a, a peace. There is just so much greatness and joy that comes comes with this life that many people do not experience simply because they don't employ this particular strategy. And she even discusses it in this book. There are so many believers that are going to make it to heaven, but never experience victory on earth. And let me tell y'all something. This life, I want all of it, all of it, every single thing. I want victory in every single area. And I refuse to take a L to an enemy that is defeated simply because I'm too lazy to master my mind. Now, throughout this chapter, she references so many scriptures that emphasize the importance of us meditating on the word, of us thinking about it, pondering on it, fixing our minds on it on a regular basis. And she started off with Psalm 119, 15. And I'm going to read it out of the New Living Translation. It says, I will study your commandments and reflect on your ways. If we even go to 16, it says, I will delight in your decrees and not forget your word. She even talks about Mark 4, 24, which says, be careful what you are hearing. The measure of thought and study you give to the truth you hear will be the measure of virtue and knowledge that comes back to you and more will be given to you who hear. Now, let me read it, read the same text in the New Living Translation. She uses, I feel like it's a blend of like the, King James Amplified versions. So I understand why she's using the Amplified version because it provides emphasis or amplifies certain words right within the text. But I believe that in that it can lose the meaning or just the totality of what the text is actually saying. So let me read it out of the New Living Translation as well. So this is in red. That means that Jesus said this. This is in the Gospels in Mark. It says, then he added, pay close attention to what you hear. The closer you listen, the more understanding you will be given and you will receive even more. I'm going to go down to verse 25. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given. But for those who are not listening, even what little they have will be taken away from them. And essentially what this text is saying, what you give to the word is what you're going to get back. 
the more that you study it, the more uh, close attention that you you pay to what the word is saying, the closer that you listen, the more understanding will be given. Remember, we always talk about welcoming the Holy Spirit and allowing us to uh, move or the importance of moving by the spirit and not by the flesh. One of the functions of the Holy Spirit is to provide us with revelation. So as we walk by the spirit, ponder on the word, study the word, think about the word consistently and allow our thoughts to go to God's commandments, the Holy Spirit will then reveal even more to us. So that's how you can continuously read the same scripture over and over again, think about it over and over again and get something different because you're giving it more attention. You're listening even more closely. And as you do that, more will be revealed to you. I have highlighted here, Joyce says, most people do not delve into the word of God very deeply. As a result, they get confused about why they are not powerful Christians living victorious lives. The truth is that most of them really don't put much effort of their own into the study of the word. They may go out and hear others teach and preach the word. They may listen to sermon CDs or podcasts or YouTube to make this more current or read the Bible occasionally, but they are not really dedicated to making the word a major part of their lives, including spending time thinking about it. The flesh is basically lazy and many people want to get something for nothing. However, that really is not the way it works. I will say it again, a person will get out of the word what he or she is willing to put into it. This episode is brought to you by NPR. I recently had a 90s and 2000s party for my birthday last week. And what was so funny is I had a bunch of different things from that whole era growing up. And one of the bigger parts of that era was talk shows. We had the Oprah Winfrey show. We had the Montel show, eventually the Tyra show. And just seeing Black representation in the media was so important for me back then because it made me realize that I can do anything. You know, I'm seeing people who look like me and it empowered me that much more to use my voice and pursue a career that I'm now in in media. The next generation of influential Black voices can be found on NPR's newest collection, Black Stories, Black Truths. Black Stories, Black Truths is a celebration of Blackness from NPR. Each of NPR's Black voices are as distinct, varied, and nuanced as the Black experience itself. In the Black Stories, Black Truths collection, you'll hear stories of joy, resilience, empowerment, and creating world-shifting things out of struggle. Every episode is a living account about what it means to be Black today, told from a unique Black perspective. From Bobby Shmurda to The Wire, Michelle Obama to reparations, there is no limit to the range of Black stories and Black truths. Black perspectives haven't always centered in the telling of America's story. Now we are the story. In NPR's Black Stories, Black Truths, you'll find a collection of some of NPR's best podcast episodes celebrating the Black experience. Hear a feed of episodes across NPR's podcast that center Black voices. It's NPR Noir. Turn on NPR today and hear a range of voices as varied, nuanced, and Black as the country we reflect. Stories should never be about us without us. Listen now to Black Stories, Black Truths from NPR wherever you get your podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Rosetta Stone. I'm personally in the process of planning a big trip for my husband's birthday, and he said that he wanted to go to East Africa. And what I believe will be the cherry on top is if we actually practice and learn the language ahead of getting there. Introducing Rosetta Stone. They are the most trusted language learning platform available on desktop or as an app. And they truly immerse you in the language that you want to learn. So I want to be fully immersed in Swahili before we board that plane to Kenya. Rosetta Stone has been the trusted expert for 30 years with millions of users in 25 languages offered. And you learn the languages fast. They immerse you in many ways. So no English translation. So you really learn to speak, listen, and think in that language. It's an intuitive process. So you pick up a language naturally, first with words, then phrases, then sentences. And it's designed for long-term retention. 
They have a built-in true accent feature that gives you feedback on your pronunciation. So it's like having a personal trainer for your accent. Their desktop and app options with audio companion and ability to download lessons offline make them extremely convenient. And of course, they have an amazing value. So your lifetime membership has all 25 languages for any and all trips and languages needed in life. That's lifetime access to all 25 language courses Rosetta Stone offers for 50% off. A total steal. Don't put off learning that language. There's no better time than right now to get started. For a very limited time, Blessed and Bossed Up listeners can get Rosetta Stone's lifetime membership for 50% off. Visit rosettastone.com slash today. That's 50% off unlimited access to 25 language courses for the rest of your life. Redeem your 50% off at rosettastone.com slash today. I have realized in recent years how important it is to prioritize spending time thinking about the word. For so long in my walk, it had been a lot about spending quiet time with God. There's There has always been just a huge emphasis on when I'm going to be in my prayer closet, when I'm going to carve out time to pray, read my word and listen and all of that. And that is, of course, extremely important. It's a necessary and vital part of our lives. But I never realized the importance of outside of that time, how beneficial and necessary it is to still think about the word. And it wasn't until recently where I was getting a little frustrated because I'm like, you know, as as my life evolves, I'm like, God, I feel like I just don't have the time that I once had to really just sit in your presence. I have a physical location, a new business with a physical location I have to drive to. I have two children now. One is in school. He has activities and all of that. I have to care for my home. I have clients and things with uh, my business. Of course, I have this podcast. So there are a lot of things going on to where sitting in my prayer closet for an hour plus daily is not fully realistic, if I'm being honest. So I'm like, God, I'm willing to do whatever it takes, right? So if I need to wake up earlier, I can do that. I wake up about five daily, period. But even still, I will have to wake up about three, four o'clock in order for me to really spend that uninterrupted time. I have a young baby, he up by six. So God, how are we gonna do this? Because, and you have to teach me how to continue to steward my time well, how to make sure that I'm serving you well. And I need you to teach me what that looks like at this stage of my life. And so one of the things that God highlighted to me is I don't need you to necessarily be sit, sitting in a quiet closet with dappy keys and your Bible and prayer journal for hours and hours and hours for you to to live a life that's pleasing to me. Of course, we're going to spend time together, but that is going to look different at this stage in your life. So yes, I'm going to read my word. I'm going to pray, but that looks different. And so what he was showing me was this principle too of spending time thinking about the word. So in that 30 minute block, that I have to read my Bible, I'm reading it. But then when I'm in the car dropping my son off to school, I'm thinking about what I read. When I'm going to the studio to meet somebody or to give a tour or whatever, I'm writing in silence, listening to what God has to say. When I'm on my way back home, I am praying and declaring and decreeing and speaking uh, towards or against whatever it is may have been revealed in my quiet time. When I'm with my baby during the day and we're playing and practicing his new skills and all of these things, I'm also thinking about the fact that I was going to do IVF. God told me no, and he allowed me to conceive spontaneously and give birth to this beautiful boy that I'm looking at. When my son is throwing a temper tantrum and I I have to lean into the spirit and say, I need patience right now, God, because he's trying it. He's trying it. And the way I was raised, I would have got popped by now, but I'm not raising my child like that. So Holy Spirit, I need you to parent me gently and teach me how to parent him gently in this moment. That's still honoring God. I'm thinking about him in the midst of a trying situation. 
When I'm having dinner with my family, I'm looking at my my oldest and thinking about all the miscarriages I had and how I was on tour and just really heartbroken and still God used me in a way, but personally heartbroken because Lord, how am I building up these people and praying for these people when I'm believing in you for something that you haven't delivered on yet? God, how am I in Dallas doing a sermon on supernatural delivery when I keep miscarrying and I'm believing in you for this and I ain't got it. So I'm really preaching by faith because it's I'm heartbroken right now. So I'm looking at my son and realizing and and remembering that as soon as that tour that I did in faith was over, that he was in my womb and I'm looking at him right now. Even in more recent weeks, I'm thinking about how I made a decision to cut back on my workload so that I could focus on my family. And I have a husband who met me right in that space and says, hey, don't worry about that. I'm going to take care of us and you do what God has called you to do without the pressure to have to produce a certain amount of income or the pressure to have to contribute financially to this household. That's not your job. So I'm thinking about the times where in my prayer journal where I wrote down the things that that I wanted in a spouse and I'm looking at my husband every day and not only does he meet the things that I wrote down but exceeded those things by far meets needs that I didn't even have the maturity to communicate at that time God knew what I needed and he blessed me in that way I think about that and so just thinking about those things on a day-to-day basis and being intentional about thinking about those things It disarms the enemy from being able to plant nagging thoughts. So when my husband does get on my nerves, (laughs) I'm not leaning into that irritation because I've already fixed my mind to think about the blessing that he is. So when my kids are acting a fool, especially my toddler and or about to be preschooler, whenever he um, tiptoes on my nerves, I'm reminded or the enemy is not able to get me to act out of character because I keep myself in a state of remembrance of I prayed for him. I fasted for him. I cried many tears and I kept my faith that the Lord will bring him to this world. And he did. When I look at my baby with with the sleepless nights and the sleep regressions and all of the, the difficulties that go into parenting multiple kids, especially in these ages and stages, I think about the times where I cried my eyes out not knowing if God was going to do it again for me. And he did. So when the enemy may try to come in in that sleep deprivation and plant seeds in my mind, it's not going to work. So for you, it's this strategy here, thinking about what you're thinking about. It's a proactive approach so you don't deal with unnecessary warfare. I think about years ago when I first read this book, how I allowed this particular chapter to be overwhelming. So much unnecessary warfare that I went uh, went through as a result of simply not pushing past that discomfort to apply the strategy. That was a foolish mistake I made back then. And so I'm telling you guys, it may sound like a lot. It may sound like too much, but that is a trick of the enemy to keep you mentally bound. And what God is providing through this chapter is a strategy. What is being revealed in these scriptures are the importance of this strategy. So don't just take Joyce's word for it. Read these scriptures, read the text. I put all the scriptures, whether I say them in the episode or not, if they come across in a chapter, I put it in the show notes. Study those things. Something else I have highlighted, she says, and this is in reference to Ephesians 2 and 3. She says, Paul warns us here that we are not to be governed by our sensual nature or to obey the impulses of, uh, of the flesh, the thoughts of our carnal mind. She says, although I was a Christian, I was having trouble because I had not learned to control my thoughts. I thought about things that kept my mind busy and were not productive in a positive way. I needed to change my thinking. One thing the Lord spoke to my heart when he began to teach me about the battlefield of the mind became a major turning point for me. He said, think about what you're thinking about. As I began to do so, it was not long before I began to see why I was having so much trouble in my life. My mind was a mess. I was thinking all the wrong things. I went to church and had done so for years, but I never actually thought about what I heard. It went in one ear and out the other, so to speak. 
I read some scriptures in the Bible every day, but never thought about what I was reading. I was not attending to the word. I was not giving any thought and study to what I was hearing. Therefore, no virtue or knowledge was coming back to me. Never forget this. Your mind plays an important role in your victory. Another part I have highlighted, she says, you should take inventory on a regular basis and ask yourself, what have I been thinking about? Spend some time examining your thought life. Thinking about what you're thinking about is very valuable because Satan usually deceives people into thinking that the source of their misery or trouble is something other than what it really is. He wants them to think that they are unhappy due to what is going on around them, but the misery is actually due to what is going on inside them. So what I want you to do as an assignment this week, I want you to do two things. First, I want you to examine your thoughts. At the end of the day, I want you to take inventory on all the things that you thought about that day. If it can, if it's too much, because if y'all like me, you spend a lot of time in your head, it can be a lot. Sometimes we forget. Write it down. Do a voice note. Say right now I'm thinking about and just write it out or excuse me, speak it out into the voice note app on your phone. At the end of the day, write it all down. I say write it down so that it's easier for you to reference. So if you do voice notes throughout the day, do like a bullet pointed list in your journal at the end of the day of the things that you spoke. But really take inventory on your thoughts and just look and see where does your mind go throughout the day? And then the second thing that I want you to do is I want you to intentionally think about the word. All of these episodes, the scriptures are in the show notes. So I want you to take all of them, take one of them. I don't care. Take one a day. I don't know how many are in this chapter because I haven't done the show notes yet, but there are enough episodes of this book. We're on chapter seven. So there are seven episodes, seven show notes with scriptures. So pick for every day this week, just pick seven scriptures. And I want you to read the scripture, read the context of it in your Bible. And then I want you to just think about it throughout the day. So as your mind is drifting, if you're scrolling on social media, stop, put the phone down and think about what you read in the text that day. After you listen to this episode, don't just move on to the next thing. Think about it later. Like, hmm, Tatum was talking about blah, blah, blah. Just think about it. That's it. Whatever sermon, whatever church you go to, whatever it is, however you feed yourself spiritually, as far as like where you gather, Think about the message that you received from uh, church. Think about the lesson uh, that your pastor gave. If you had a conversation with a friend and they poured into you or they gave you a scripture, just think about it. Just make it a, a conscious effort to meditate, ponder, and attend to the word. So that's it for this episode. I pray that it blessed you. Leave us a five-star review if it did. I am looking forward to our next episode. Uh, The next bonus, we will go on to chapter eight. Get the book if you want to continue. If not, continue to listen to the episodes. I love you guys and I'll talk to you next week.